And they, we are going to be talking about Professor Alva's new book, The Great Demographic Illusion, Majority, Minority, and the Expanding American Mainstream. Now, really this talk couldn't be more timely because we just saw the new census results released. And if you were keeping track of the press coverage, you might've noticed that Professor Alba was frequently quoted on the significance of these new findings. His work today builds on earlier work, including a series of books on the impact of immigration on identity um, in the United States. And he developed a theory of neo-assimilation with Professor Victor Ney, and they presented that in their award-winning 2003 book, Remaking the American Mainstream, Assimilation and Contemporary Immigration. And then Professor Alba followed up with Blurring the Color Line, The New Chance for a More Integrated America in 2009. And so this book really builds on that earlier work. We're also very fortunate to have Professor Brown as our commentator. She is an award-winning author in her own right, having written uh, Parents Without Papers with Professors Frank Bean and James Bachmeyer. And that won the 2016 Otis Dudley Duncan Award for best book from the population section of the American Sociological Association. In this uh, work, she explores along with professors Bean and Bachmeyer, the impact of undocumented status of parents on their children's mobility in the Mexican origin community. Uh, Professor Brown also directs the UC Irvine master's program in demographic and social analysis. Now, before we get started, I wanted to just acknowledge the people who have made this event possible. First of all, I wanna thank our former Dean Song Richardson and our current interim Dean Bryant Garth for the support of UC Irvine School of Law. And I also wanted to thank the director Ajay Marotra and the American Bar Foundation for ongoing support of this project. Of course, resources are great, but it doesn't happen without people who turn those resources into an actual event. And I wanted to thank Robbie Kadri and Aaron Hebert here at the law school for their help in doing this book talk series. And finally, my most special thanks goes to Elizabeth Schatz Cordero, who is my research assistant, is a law student here at UC Irvine doing just terrific work in her studies and with me. And um, she is going to be keeping the queue. So if you have questions, please submit them to through the question and answer function. Elizabeth will monitor that and pose the question to our speakers. So now I wanted to let our conversation begin. Um, Professor Moran, thank you very much for the invitation. Let me see if I can get my screen share up. Okay, I think, whoops. Um, hmm. Oh, here it is. I hope, can you see? Yes, okay. So let me actually, I should start the slideshow. Okay, so I'm going to be talking um, from my book, although there, um, there will be some updated information. Um, the Great Demographic Illusion uh, refers to um, what I see as the dominant narrative, demographic narrative about our society, um, which is the idea that by the middle of this century, whites will become a minority of the population and minorities <clears throat> in the aggregate will become the majority. This is often uh, fit under the classification demography is destiny, the idea that somehow um, we can't avoid the hardness of uh, demographic facts as they unroll. Um, and I want to point out um, before kind of getting into the the depth or the details of my own study, um, what I see as some of the negative uh, aspects of this demographic narrative. And one is um, that it's a very, it provides a very simplistic picture of American society. It sees the society as really divided in two um, along a fault line um, with one side gaining and the other side losing, at least in demographic terms. Um, and um, a number of scholars have observed that uh, this narrative has had some 
um, sort of negative impacts, um, particularly in, uh, in the white population. So there's a very strong um, research stream in social psychology, um, which shows that when whites are uh, reminded about this demographic scenario, um, that they express anxiety about the future. Um, they uh, be express also more conservative political attitudes and some degree of racial resentment toward minorities. Um, political scientists analyzing the 2016 election have pointed to racial resentment, in fact, of non-college educated whites as an important factor in the Trump victory. Um, so the one big problem with the uh, with this this narrative is that it is colliding with an important trend that it really doesn't take into account or nor does it make room for and that trend is the increasing um, mixing across major ethno-racial lines within families and especially mixing between whites and uh, people of color. Um, intermarriage is one measure of that. <clears throat> the Pew Research Center does a regular update on the state of intermarriage and most recently it estimated that one-fifth of new marriages in the United States um, unites partners from different uh, major ethno-racial categories and the great majority of these intermarriages involve a white partner and a minority partner um, and the largest group of all by the way unites whites and Hispanics something that we should keep our eye on as the talk unfolds. Um, this binary narrative the majority minority society um, just as I say, doesn't really kind of have room for a large growing group that sits athwart um, this division line between whites and uh, people of color. Well, needless to say, you know, if people are forming families across ethno-racial lines, it means that we have um, a larger number of young Americans coming from mixed ethno-racial backgrounds, and indeed we do. So I'm showing data from 2017. Um, at that point, one of every seven births in the United States involved parents from two different uh, major ethno-racial categories. Three quarters of, that, of those mixed births involved a white parent and a parent who would be classified as non-white um, according to Census Bureau rules. The largest group of all um, uh, involves a parent who is non-Hispanic and white and a parent who is, who is Hispanic. So that 40% of all of the mixed children in 2017 came from uh, such a family background. Half of all of the mixed white minority children came from uh, such a background. Other large categories are children of a black parent and a white parent, children of an Asian parent and a white parent, and a category that may seem a little confusing at first, children of a white parent and a mixed race parent. And most of these are children who have three white grandparents and they have one non-white or Hispanic um, grandparent. Um, this tr new trend of mixing um, interacts in, um, uh, in some confusing ways with the way that the Census Bureau classifies people by um, ethno-racial backgrounds. So a problem is that the Census Bureau defines white in a narrow exclusive way. White means conventionally that a person is non-Hispanic and only white um, uh, by race. And by the way, in the headlines about the 2020 census, which, um, which uh, broadcast the notion that whites were really declining a lot in numbers, that is the way white was defined. So uh, implied then is that individuals who are partly white and partly non-white are classified as uh, non-white or minority in sort of the key census data classifications. So the argument I make is that this is really not a very sensible decision 
um, or sensible classification at a moment when mixing is um, such a large part of uh, what's going on in, in our country. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so if we consider um, that people who are partly white are also white in some sense, um, then in fact, the white group had, did not decline in the 2020 um, census. The uh, idea of the uh, majority minority society is based on population projections by uh, the Census Bureau. And another problem um, in Census Bureau data is the assumption that the category, the ethno-racial category memberships of individuals are fixed and unchanging um, over the life course. So one of the aspects of mixing that I will bring out as we talk is that the identities of mixed individuals are not in fact fixed, that they are fluid, um, that they change from time to time. So wait, wait, why am I? I'm sorry, I'm having, ah, there we go. So how should we think about mixing in the 21st century? Well, I think um, mixed origins have a status in this century that they did not have previously. Um, think, for example, of the one drop rule, which assigned uh, people who were mixed white and black to the black group um, in the 20th century um, and before. It exemplifies the more general social pressures on mixed individuals to affiliate with one origin or the other. And I think what's different in the 21st century is that um, mixed individuals are not under that kind of social pressure, um, that mixed identities have a new uh, status in, in our society. And um, that's exemplified then by what I referred to as the fluidity of mixed identities, which means that people who are mixed may sometimes identify themselves as mixed or sometimes identify themselves as members of single categories. And frequently, um, that single category is white. Um, so we tend to think of race with an older sociological model of ascription, meaning that race is assigned at birth and unchanging over the life course. And this model, I argue, no longer works well in the 21st century because of the rise of mixing, the surge of mixing, especially among young Americans. Um, let me just briefly mention the idea of assimilation. Professor Moran was kind enough to refer to the theory of neo-assimilation, which I think is very relevant here. And what uh, Victor Nee and I did in our book on assimilation was to kind of rethink the idea of assimilation so that assimilation no longer had to be equated in American society with becoming a member of the white majority group, that um, assimilation means not necessarily that your group membership has changed, but rather that your group membership has much less impact on where you wind up in the society and how you interact um, uh, with other people. Um, and so we argue that a better way to think about assimilation rather than as assimilation into the white group as a, is as assimilation into the mainstream of society where, um, uh, where the impact of ethno-racial backgrounds is much less than it is when we look at the society as a whole. <laughs> okay, so we have a lot of data now about individuals from mixed ethno-racial backgrounds. And um, I think that it shows something very important about how, on the whole, they are fitting into um, American uh, society. And um, the bottom paragraph here is perhaps the most important one on this slide. And namely, I think that is in terms of thinking about where individuals fit, what's most important is to think about in what social milieus they place um, themselves. Um, and um, at this historical moment, um, the mainstream of American society is still white dominated, reflecting um, you know, the 
the domination of the white group um, throughout American history. Um, and so fitting into the mainstream means also fitting into social milieus in which whites are an important part of the, uh, of the others in, in those environments. So um, on that basis, I would say that the data that we have shows that most mixed minority white Americans, and remember these are the majority of all people from mixed backgrounds, are in fact affiliating with the mainstream part of American society. They are not necessarily becoming white, they are therefore expanding the mainstream and diversifying it within by asserting their distinctive identities, for example. There is one very important exception. The data are very clear that individuals coming from um, a black white family backgrounds have experiences that are distinctive, uh, experiences that are much more strongly marked by um, racism than is the case for other um, mixed white minority individuals. And so we could say that people of black white background are not barred from the mainstream, but they face much higher barriers than others um, to entering the mainstream. So what are the findings that lead me to this conclusion? Well, one is that um, mixed minority white youth start life in more favorable um, family and um, social circumstances than do minority individuals. Um, this is indicated, for instance, by the higher parental education um, in these mixed families. They are more likely to grow up in neighborhoods that may be diverse, but also have uh, many white families. They achieve better educational outcomes than do members of the uh, of minority groups other than Asians. Um, they mix with whites. They have many white friends. They live in neighborhoods with many whites as adults, um, but they don't necessarily exclusively mix with whites. And perhaps most important about where they fit in American society is that they have very high rates of marriage to whites, reflecting certainly the white presence in their social environments. And finally, their identities are fluid. Um, they are not consistent over time. Sometimes they are identify as mixed and at other times as members of single groups. Okay, let me speak a little bit about the identities and then I'm gonna go into um, identities of mixed white Hispanic individuals. <laughs> So we have one study that looks at, um, uh, at census data over time. How do people identify themselves in the 2000 census? How do the same individuals identify themselves in the 2010 census? And the big surprise is that um, there's a great deal of inconsistency over time in the identities of, of mixed um, Americans in particular. For example, only a third of Asian white individuals are consistent between the two censuses. And when they identify with a single group, they tend to identify as white. Um, for black white Americans, it's also there's also a great deal of inconsistency, except now they identify um, more as black than as white. Now, we also have a study emanating from the Census Bureau, again, looking at census data, the same individuals <clears throat> in different census data sets over time that shows an important degree of inconsistency among Latinos. So more than a fifth of US born Latinos do not consistently um, report themselves as Latino or Hispanic on the census. When they don't identify as Latino, the great majority um, appears as non-Hispanic um, and uh, white. And so this is very consistent, of course, <clears throat> with the rise of intermarriage between whites and Hispanics, and really, which is a very long-standing pattern, in fact, dating back 
decades into the 20th century, um, and therefore with a weakening of Hispanic identity that appears to occur both across generations, but also among people who emanate from, uh, from intermarriages. So I think it's important in thinking about Hispanics in this century to begin to think about the heterogeneity of Hispanic identities, which does in fact have to do with the substantial um, mixed Hispanic white group that mostly in the census appears as part of the Hispanic group, but it's not clearly identified um, in, in census data. So Pew did a study of Hispanic identity, which indicated that by the third and later generations, <clears throat> um, most Hispanic Americans prefer to describe themselves as just American rather than as Latino um, or as Hispanic American. Um, another data point that's relevant is that um, is a study that was done by Ian Haney Lopez, a very well-known critical race scholar and Tony Gavito. And they uh, interviewed Hispanic voters prior to the 2020 census. And they were surprised to find that the majority of the people they interviewed did not view themselves as people of color, sort of people who are on the other side of this white minority divide in American society. And in fact, they saw themselves often as similar to the descendants of the European immigrants. And in general, they saw themselves as candidates for integrating into the mainstream um, of American society. Um, sort of an interesting side note here has to do with the 2020 census. So a lot has been made of the apparent rise of mixed race identities among Hispanics in the 2020 census. And the LA Times a couple of weeks ago carried an op-ed um, that suggested that this indicated that Hispanics were turning away from whiteness and indeed expressing greater uh, solidarity with other people of color. So the 2020 census is unusual, really unique, because the census in an effort to better identify racially mixed Americans changed the rules for racial classification. And this change had an impact on the white group and it had a huge impact on the Hispanic group. And let me explain how this came about. So in the 2020 census, people were invited to write ethnic labels if they checked either the white or black boxes. This is the first time that's happened on a decennial census. The census then um, scrutinized the labels that were written in and reclassified people when they found indications of racial mixture in these labels. In particular, and this is very clear in the census description of these rules, when Latino individuals checked white and wrote a Latin American label like Mexican as an ethnic label under the white box, they were classified as not only white, but also some other race. And therefore they became mixed. So I think this is really the major explanation for why there was such a profound shift um, in the distribution of Hispanics between the white racial group and the mixed um, racial group. And by the way, you can see um, in, the, uh, in the website that the Census Bureau makes available for the 2020 census data that more than 90% of mixed race Hispanics check the white box and more than 90% of mixed race Hispanics were classified as having some other race. No other racial category aside from those two accounts for more than a trivial part of the mixed race Hispanics in, in 2020. Okay, in closing, let me point out some other changes that are taking place in American society and also fueling 
um, the changes that I think are taking place in American families. And one of them has to do with the changes that are taking place at the top of the workforce. Um, and these changes are being promoted by um, a demographic shift, a shift to a much more diverse um, working age population. So there's a kind of a synchronization in this respect of some really important demographic phenomena. One is that the large, heavily white baby boom, the people born between 1946 and 1964 are aging out of the workforce. They are opening up thereby a lot of positions for which there are not enough whites to fill them. Um, because indeed the youth groups that are maturing into um, the working age are much more diverse and have much smaller um, white contingents. So there's an effect, a kind of a non-zero sum mobility which is occurring, which as whites leave, the younger people who are there to fill these jobs are um, much more, um, have many fewer whites and hence there's much more mobility by people of non-white and or mixed background. One can see this very clearly in the way that the top part of the workforce is changing. So here in this table, I'm looking at the, <clears throat> the composition of the top, I'm calling the top quarter of jobs. And um, maybe you'll just uh, allow me not to get into the details of how this is defined. I think it's defined in a reasonable way. And what this table shows is a shift from white domination of the top to much greater diversity in the top over time. So if we look at the, I'm oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. If we look at the oldest age group um, in the year, in the census year 2000, 90% nearly of the workers at the top were non-Hispanic and white. In the next cohort here, 86 and 85.3%, this is the older part of the baby boom. Um, again, you know, in the mid 80%, um, was non-Hispanic and white. If we now look down to the more recent year and younger age groups, these are people 67.0. Uh, this represents people who are in their 30s in 2015. Now more than a third of the workers are not exclusively white. That means that they are minority or they are mixed white and minority. And the same is true for the youngest age group in the 2015 data, people who are in their late 20s. So we really have major changes that are taking place um, in, the, in, the, in the most remunerated and highest status part of the workforce that reflect the growing diversity of American society and a decrease in white monopolization of the best positions in American society. Okay, so. Professor, um, I'll you're at the 25 minute mark. Just thank you very much. And I'm on my last slide. So we're going to have plenty of time for discussion. Okay. So let me leave you with some conclusions. Um, even if it turns out that by the middle of the century, the US is a majority minority society in the sense that whites are a minority and people of color are the majority, it will not look like we currently imagine it because of this growth of the mixed population. The mixed population has been growing steadily since the last decades of the 20th century. And with every new year of birth data, um, it, it forms a larger part of the total births um, in the United States, there is no end in, in sight, at least in the near future, to the increase um, uh, in mixing. This expansion and diversification in the mainstream part of our society has echoes in a way, not, it doesn't, it, it's not a perfect replication, but it resembles in some important respects what happened in the middle of the 20th century, when again, um, the mainstream expanded and became more diverse because it was no longer exclusively dominated by white Protestants, 
but now white Catholics and Jews joined it in the two decades um, following uh, the end of World War II. We are at a moment of great attention to the importance of racism in our society. And of course, um, it, that attention is fully justified. Um, uh, the Black Lives Movement has shown um, that structural racism is really important to the maintenance of racial inequality in the United States. But I argue that we cannot understand the changes that are taking place in American society solely with a lens attuned to racism. We also need to attend to assimilation, which is changing the very top of American society. And I would argue that um, this is the permanent paradox of American society, that it combines racism for some um, and assimilation um, for others. Um, I believe in light of this, we need a new narrative about the future of diversity in our society. The majority minority narrative is misleading. Um, it's flawed as I hope I've convinced you on scientific grounds and it is deeply polarizing. It has contributed to the extreme polarization of our, of our politics. Other narratives are possible um, and they are ones that, that a wider group of Americans can buy into as a hopeful future um, for the United States. And finally, I think it's important not to embrace the notion that demography is destiny, that somehow our destiny is written into population developments that have already occurred. Um, our demographic future in terms of majorities and minorities is in a fundamental sense indeterminate because it depends upon um, the social locations of people coming from minority backgrounds, coming from mixed backgrounds. These locations are going to be determined by sociological, economic forces, as well as by public policy. They are not strictly determined by demography. And I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Alba. Now we're going to hear from Professor Brown, and I know she has some slides of her own that she's going to be sharing with us. Uh, it says I can't share the screen while the other participant is sharing. Oh, I, don't, I think I stopped. No. Uh, help. There. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I will close this, but I somehow the screen won't let me. So uh, let's see. Well, it's very clear. There we go. Okay. There we go. All right. Uh, thank you for inviting me, and I appreciate the chance to comment on this extraordinary book. And it is in many ways truly extraordinary because it represents the culmination of 50 years worth of work on Richard's part, uh, his entire career. You can see elements of it brought into this book and 50 years worth of thinking of ideas that are here and building on the work of other scholars as well. Um, I find that the book is very big. Its uh, successes are that it is even-handed, succinct in many ways, uh, very clearly written, nuanced, complicated, and brave in, in many ways. Uh, it also does a lot. And so what I'm hoping to do in just a few minutes here is cover the highlights, the key themes, because there are, there's so much in here that it, it can be easy to overlook what it does. The major accomplishments of this book, as I see it, are that it rejects 
the popular majority minority narrative. That's the illusion here that whites are becoming a minority population and it embraces a broader narrative. Uh, its rejection is based on criticism in large part of the way that census measures whites and non-whites by making people who have some non-white ancestry the dominant characteristic so that any kind of white ancestry doesn't show up in the census. And this is in many ways misleading, particularly in light as he shows clearly of the growth of a very fluid self-definition of race. The second great big thing that he does is he shows how individuals who have both white and non-white ancestry by bi biracial or by ethnic who are now char characterized only as minorities in many ways reflect the experiences and the outcomes of the white majority. They may not entirely reflect the experiences of white, but they're certainly leaning in that direction, suggesting that characterizing them only as minority, again, may be misleading. And he musters a lot of evidence for this. And it's uh, a, a large contribution because it's often difficult to measure people of the second and especially the third generation and how they are experiencing life because the census doesn't give you a clear third generation. The third thing he does, and in many ways, this is the most optimistic aspect of the book, is show convincingly how intermarriage is expanding the American mainstream and leading to this growing mixed ancestry population. And this too shows you know, a, a lot of diversity in a very positive light. But at the same time, he is very clear-eyed in emphasizing the barriers to inclusion that face mixed race persons with black heritage. And here he is expanding on a large body of work of her Gans, Lee and B, and many others. He gives, he acknowledges some of the other racial theories, but really comes down on a black, non-black divide as being crucial, a crucial divide in American society. He has more notable accomplishments. First, among these is that he ties the acceptance of immigrants to inequality in the United States. The growth of inequality has made it very difficult. It's made it easy to scapegoat immigrants and it has slowed the ability of immigrant groups to show mobility because uh, unless the baby boom generation is retiring, uh, it's much harder for them to achieve movement upward. College is more expensive. Um, the ability to get good jobs is more difficult when the minimum wage has been stuck for as many years as it has. When the income distribution is very, very poor uh, for people at the bottom of the distribution, that means it's harder for immigrants who have come in there to really achieve middle class upward mobility. At the same time, he points out the reasons for this sense of grievance among native whites who also are facing this kind of inequality in distribution and how they feel resentful and often may take it out on immigrant groups or feel that they have been left behind. And he points out the importance of higher education at public universities, which is where the mo most people are educated for immigrant group mobility. And as someone coming from Cooney, where this immigrant mobility is really a, a big deal and it's a big option, I very much appreciate that. And since the University of California is a West Coast equivalent, I also want to say a shout out for public universities at their ability to really provide higher education for first and second generation college students. Uh, Another thing that he does that I find out find particularly 
valuable is he carves out a complementary space for critical race theory and for assimilation. And he talks about the importance of critical race theory. He talks about its advantages and he talks about its limitations in looking at assimilation theory and where the cultural mechanisms for promoting assimilation have worked. This is brave, but it is also contributing to a growing discussion of how race theory can work for immigrant groups and how there is a room for multiple ways of looking at it. And last, he highlights the nonlinear path of acceptance for Italian and Jewish immigrants. And uh, this is important because a lot of children of immigrants now say, well, look, they became white, you know, and this isn't happening to us. But this was a very slow and uneven process. And by showing this, he also shows that the pathways to mobility is, is a steep and often rocky one. So I find that these are all really important things that he has done. Another big accomplishment is the, his promotion of a non-zero-sum assimilation theory so that everyone can get ahead and no one gets behind. And he shows how this happened for European ethnics, uh, how the status uplift occurred for them in the post-war economic boom, how they could move to white suburbs and work in integrated workplaces, and how the World War II threw people together and how popular television shows helped destigmatize European ethnics. Um, nowadays, he points out that this status uplift happens through education and better jobs, through the retirement of the baby boom opening up jobs, through neighborhood integration, through intermarriage, and through greater diversity in popular culture. Uh, so these are you know, all really big accomplishments in this book. If I had any criticism, it's, it is very mild. This is kind of a flyover book. It's got a big ideas, it's got a good thesis, but in his introduction, he calls it, a, his argument is a series of nested Russian dolls. And I found that a fascinating kind of way of describing the book. Uh, because if you have series of nested Russian dolls, you have to open one and open the other and open the next one. And I found in looking at his arguments, I thought that each of these nested dolls was worth looking at. And I wanted to take apart and look at all of them. But when you have that series of nested dolls, it's hard to do that. You know, you do, you, the totality of it is, is what you see and not each individual doll. And I really wanted to look at all of them because his arguments were so good. And I think that perhaps it's easy to lose sight of each one of these dolls in looking at the totality because he, uh, is covering so much in, in relatively small amount of space very succinctly. Chapter three, for instance, looks at the size of legal immigration, the diminishment of the percentage of the white population over the decades, a history of population projections and the popular press on this, the reaction to the press in terms of cultural definitions of whiteness, how contact theory, how people experience diversity at the neighborhood level, and then it concludes with status threat. That's all in one chapter. That's a lot, and every single part of it was really interesting and, and worth discussing. So there is a, a, you know, a lot in these Russian dolls, and it, this book is worth a lot of study and needs a lot of study to, to get the full argument. And in, because there's so much, it's easy for it to just sort of mention things and move on. And I noticed one of the questions coming up is, is looking at Afro origin immigrants. How does the book deal with those? And it does, but only in, in passing. And I will let Richard get to the question itself. So um, there's a lot in this book. Uh, and I would have loved to have seen, say, chapter three be a whole book in its own right. So it's worth studying. It's worth assigning to classes. It's a fascinating book. And uh, I really think that there is a lot there. I am very excited about it. I think it is a wonderful contribution overall. 
So with that, I will close and let people start asking their questions. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Brown, for those insights. It is a big book. I do want to give Professor Alba a chance to respond, but I also want to get to our questions. So um, why don't, Professor Alba, if you have any responses, maybe you could integrate that into answering the questions. And so Elizabeth, if you could start posing the questions from the audience and maybe uh, we can bring the screen down also, Professor uh, Brown, your slides. Yes, thank Great. you both so much. Thank you very um, much. The first question Professor Alba was asked during your conversation on census data research, and it is, does this research account for Afro-Latinos or is it focused primarily on Latinos who are of European descent? Okay, so um, that's a really good question. And I don't think that I can give a fully comprehensive answer to it. Um, I think there's certainly colorism <clears throat> is important when we discuss the Latino population and its ability to uh, to relate to uh, to the dominant group of whites. Um, I, I don't think given the, you know, the the high levels of, of marriage between whites and Hispanics, it's very unlikely that this is limited only to European descent Hispanics. But I'm certain that um, that Afro Latinos like African Americans face a you know a much tougher um, situation because of the racism of American society, without question. Professor Brown, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, no. I I think that, that that's fine. Okay. The next question is. Would it be fair to say that then that by the end of the century, the majority of the population will be composed of people who will be members of an ethno-racial mixed group and not of a quote minority? Uh, I, I, I don't think we can easily project. I, I would not project that far ahead. I don't think population projections are very meaningful um, when they go beyond, let's say, 25 years because the assumptions on which they are based are likely to be falsified over over a long period of time. It's unclear how large um, the group emerging from contemporary mixing is going to be, let's say, by mid-century. It'll be much larger than it is today, but it's it's certainly not clear that it'll be the majority by the end of the century. One thing that I would add would be that the mixing will be probably geographically distributed so that we already know, for instance, that California and Hawaii are extremely diverse and extremely mixed. It's not so clear whether this kind of mixing would extend as much to places like Vermont or Maine, uh, which are the some of the whitest states and the oldest states. So where immigrants settle will have a lot to do with how the diversity unfolds. That's a very good point. And we do welcome additional questions in the question and answer function. Um, in the meantime, I wanted to just ask a quick question about the politics of the demography, because you mm. present very thorough empirical analysis of a variety of issues related to demographic change. But this dominant narrative may serve other purposes. And one question is, is, the, is demography getting weaponized in the ways that other kinds of information well, get that's weaponized? A, that, that's a very good point. And certainly um, the majority minority narrative has been adopted by the right and weaponized in precisely the way that you're implying. So for example, you know, very conservative commentators like uh, Tucker Carlson are invoking so-called replacement theory, which holds that um, elites in the wealthy Western societies seek to replace the native white population with minorities coming from the global South. Um, and you know, so there is a political intent 
um, in invoking this idea of whites declining, majorities, uh, rather minorities eventually replacing them. But I think even also on the left, there's there's some degree of, of politicization of the idea in the sense that there are some on the left who argue uh, for on behalf of minorities that, well, whites are going to be a minority of the population um, by the middle of the century. And therefore, it's essential, you know, that the United States adopt changes that accommodate minority groups today. So yes, it's definitely the idea is very involved with the political battles that take place today in the US. Professor Brown, did you want to add anything on that? I think that not only is demography being weaponized, I mean, I agree with that on both the right and the left. I think the Census Bureau has been perhaps unwittingly, but it's certainly uh, not critically feeding into this by the way that it has been characterizing minority populations of anyone who has any mixed ancestry being non-white. I mean, that it, it's a disingenuous way of getting to a population that is 100% count as opposed to more than 100% if someone is, is white and non-white somehow getting counted twice. Um, and the movement toward being able to check more than one box means that you, you end up with this multiplicity of boxes. And for the sake of making things easy, people try to condense the boxes. And that inherently creates the, the opportunity to politicize it. So I think that the very way that the census collects the data lends itself to politicization. Yeah, let me add to that. So I think that we can see this very clearly in the way the Census Bureau reported um, the 2020 census data. So as I said earlier, the census made changes in the way people were racially classified in 2020 in an effort, a laudable effort actually, to better identify um, the mixed population. But when it, and it therefore, by the way, in its press release, cautioned about comparisons between 2010 and 2020 census figures for the for this what appear to be the same groups but then in its press release it it ignored those cautions and invoked comparisons um, that in fact are misleading and play into this this kind of polarization so for example the press release says that the number of um white only Americans declined by 8%. And that's an extremely misleading figure because of the census changes in racial classification that took place. It's very affected actually by the, um, by the classification of many Latinos as having mixed race. Um, in 2020. And it's, you know, it's just, it's a very misleading number. It doesn't really tell us um, anything very useful about, about the white population. Okay, we've got a lot of questions now. So we, Elizabeth, take it away. Um, are there useful lessons, parallels or contrasts to be drawn from the ethno-racial dynamics in other non-US societies? Yeah, what a good question. Um, I don't see anything. Well, I've, I've written about a lot about Europe and indeed I wrote a book with a colleague, Nancy Foner, called Strangers No More, which made an effort to compare integration dynamics in North America and selected Western European countries. I don't see anything yet in Europe that resembles what's taking place um, in the United States. And I think that the United States is helped by its experience of integrating um, the descendants of, of even very impoverished immigrants in the past. Um, and so Americans tend to see 
this contemporary period of mixing as not very different really in principle from you know the mixing um, between different religious groups of whites or mixing across ethnic lines of whites um, that has occurred in the past other european the uh, many other countries european countries in particular don't have this kind of history that they can draw on and to get back to our last question there are many other countries ask different kinds of census questions where they don't have a census at all anymore and the united states doesn't ask religion on its census but canada does uh, France famously doesn't ask about race in its census. And so the, the way that census data can be used in other countries is inherently different too. We only have a few minutes and we have several questions. So Elizabeth, why don't you throw out all the questions and let our speakers decide which they would like to answer maybe. Yes, I can read them now. Um, is there any way to find within the existing data sets counts of people who identify as Black and Hispanic, or are the numbers of Black and Hispanic population hard to disaggregate from the white Hispanic category or the mixed category? Also, I imagine these categories don't attend to differences between African American identities and Black global identities. Um, additional question is that you mentioned the importance of higher education in advancing tran transformation. Could you discuss areas for improvement? And the final question is, doesn't the Census Bureau have an obligation to explain the changes in, for example, the decline in white only population, or at least the changes in the way it is collecting data in its press release? Okay, I'll take the last one first. So um, the census certainly has an obligation to, and it, and it fulfills that obligation to explain how it classifies people in racial and ethnic terms. And it did indeed ha issue a memo um, that uh, explains the changes that um, it made f in the 2020 census. Where I think it failed is to take into account the implications of those changes for the comparisons. Um, and I think it's especially contentious for the white group. Um, so it didn't explain, it didn't take into account those changes in then drawing conclusions about white decline, which of course have been broadcast very widely and adopted, especially on the, on the right side of the, of, this, of the political spectrum to, you know, to decry uh, the changes that are taking place in, in American society today. So that that is a, that uh, the census doesn't think of itself as having an obligation to interpret the data, but in effect it does interpret the data, or at least put down a first interpretation, which many people then run with. Susan. Um, well, I think I will look at briefly at Doug's question about opportunities for improving higher education. And the main one is access, making sure that more people have access. Um, the pandemic in many ways, surprisingly, has helped that because it made it so much harder to take SATs that it hastened uh, the movement of a lot of universities away from SATs and allowed more types of students to apply. And I think that going forward, trying to make it easier to apply, to encouraging people to apply, uh, my own research a long time ago on the effects of ending affirmative action showed that going out and encouraging students to apply was critical to getting more to come because they needed to be invited and told they were welcome. And that that alone could, was one start, but an important one to getting more types of people into, the, into higher education. Well, and on that hopeful note, uh, we're going to conclude our session. I wanted to thank our speakers, Professor Alba and Professor Brown. I wanted to thank all of you for joining us today and for sharing your 
very helpful questions for our uh, speakers and wanted to invite you to our next book talk on October 7th with Professor Adriana Villavicencio. And she'll be talking about her book, Am I My Brother's Keeper? which explores the educational success initiative in New York City to improve, and this is very apt given the final comment, college readiness uh, among Black and Latinx youth. So thank you so much. We very much appreciate your joining us today. Thank you again, Professor Moran, for the invitation. And Susan, I hope to see you sometime in the near future in some other way other than Zoom. Yes. <laughs> okay. Bye, everyone.